My name is Dr. Fei Lin, and I'm senior editor of Gen Biotechnology, the new peer-reviewed journal launching in early 2022, aiming to publish outstanding original research and perspectives across all facets of the biotech industry. I have the honor of being joined today by the editor-in-chief of Gen Biotechnology, Hannah El Samad, professor and vice chair in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics at the University of California, San Francisco. Some of her numerous prestigious honors include being named a Paul G. Allen Distinguished Investigator, a Senior Investigator of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, and a Fellow at the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering. So we're here today not only to chat about why we're excited for the launch of Gen Biotechnology and what the journal has to offer during this booming time of biotech, but also who you are, Hannah, as a scientist and activist. So I've expressed how incredibly excited I was when you came on board for Gen Biotechnology. And when I was a PhD student studying cell signaling and computational modeling, I've been a huge fan of your work in synthetic cell signaling circuits for a very long time. So we're beyond excited to have you. I want to ask what excited you most about the editor-in-chief role at Gen Biotechnology? Hi, Faye. Um, where, where do I start? So much to be excited about, not the least of it, having the opportunity to work with you. Uh, so that's that's great. Um, okay, so let me let me actually uh, you know mention two things that are kind of the top of my excitement barometer. Uh, the first is uh, the topic itself. Uh, biotechnology has 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 seen a wind whirl of innovation in the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, progress has been just so amazing on so many levels, at the conceptual level, at the technological level. Uh, but also, in addition to this uh, technical um, and conceptual progress, there has been this realization both inside the biotechnology field and outside of it, uh, that um, that, that innovation in biotechnology, using biology as a substrate for innovation, is necessary, is an absolute must. Uh, to deal with our environmental issues, to design radically new therapeutics. Um, so, so now is the time to start thinking about a, a broad uh, you know, publishing platform uh, that is wide enough to capture the incredible, the truly incredible reach and spread of biotechnology. Uh, so that's one reason. The other is, um, Frankly, the, 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 the current pandemic, the COVID pandemic, and the realization that science and, and, and biotechnology really came to our rescue in, 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 in incredible ways. Uh, coupled to that is the realization that many of us in this field have had uh, that some big fraction of people in our country and actually around the world uh, might have an inaccurate view of how science did it and what biotechnology and its immense promise really are. So I was really attracted to this opportunity of being part of a new adventure that is pioneered by a publishing company uh, that has a track record of engagement with the public through its gen uh, platform, which is, as you know, of course, a 40 year old trusted platform in, in biotech and bioengineering news. So I, re I really like this idea uh, of scientific rigorous peer review publishing and science journalism coming together organically um, to engage a broad audience. I love that. I love how you put all of those pieces together. And I just want to echo all of those reasons for why you're on board or also the reasons why I'm on board for this, this combination of it's such a booming type, uh, exciting time for biotechnology, both yes. in the academic and industry perspectives, and also capitalizing on the fact that science isn't just about the research, but also how we communicate science, the activism in science, the diversity, equity, inclusion in science, which I am super excited to go into biotechnology from all of these different avenues with you on board and how we can really make a difference in this field. And during our chat today, I'm, I'm really excited to not only get to know your vision for how we're gonna make an impact, but also 
your backstory and how you came to enter biotechnology. And I guess one of the questions to start there is, is first, how did you get interested in biotechnology? And were you always interested in biotechnology from a young age? If I want to be really honest, the answer is no. Um, I, I was good at science from a young age, uh, but growing up, I was more interested in, in writing and literature, actually, um, than I was in science. I, I loved math. So math was a, had always a special place uh, because it was always satisfying to me in its clarity and conciseness. And literature was like at this opposite end. And I liked the, that they fit on both extremes. Biology, at least, you know, biology I learned in high school was like this kind of fluff in the middle, <laughs> right? It wasn't literature and it wasn't math. And it was, at least to me at that, at that age, very poorly defined. Um, so, uh, so it wasn't really until grad school that I um, learned to appreciate the beauty of biology, and it, it, I, I, you know, I started thinking about it from two, um, you, you know, I, I started to appreciate it from really two angles. Uh, the first is I realized uh, that biology can be captured with math. That was such a revelation for me that we can actually. Uh, model and quantitatively characterize biological processes. Um, so that's, that's one. The second is that I also realized that, um, uh, you know, despite what we learned and uh, what we learn in textbooks, you know, which is, you know, these, this list of facts about how biology is and what evolution gave us, um, actually there is a possibility to manipulate biology. Right, and this is this is the angle of the you know biotechnology um, that we can uh, potentially manipulate manipulate biology with high precision through materials that can either interface with biology or through biological you know um, molecule that we can compose in circuits and so on. Um, so so it's actually the promise of biotechnology in that sense that uh, brought me back to biology as an area of interest. I love that. And from what I remember, you started out with more of an engineering background and then transitioned yes. to biology later yes. in your career. So was there a spark that that was that aha moment of I can be applying all of these, if it's the math, the engineering skills to biology and make great things happen there? Whoops. Yes. So so my background, as you mentioned, is in <clears throat> is in engineering specifically in a field of engineering called control and dynamical systems theory. Uh, and that's basically the field of engineering that is tasked with building systems that can function robustly in uncertain environments through the use of feedback control. So and feedback control is this ability of a system to continuously sense its internal states and the world around it, compile this information, reason with it, compute with it, and then come up with um, courses of action to maintain the operation of that system in a robust way. Uh, so, you know, you can think about the thermostat in your house, about the, the, the autopilot control in, in, the, in planes, you know, you can think about, you know, robots, you know, uh, surgical equipment, the control on your microscope, all of it uses this idea of feedback control and control algorithms. So the aha moment was when I realized that that's why we're alive, right? This is why, um, you know, we're bombarded all the time. Our cells, our organs are bombarded all the time with all of this stuff from our environment. Yes, yet we, we function, we walk and we breathe and we fight cancer every day. And this is because of these feedback control systems that operate at every level of biological organization. And at that moment, I realized that actually my background in control theory um, is the right background to start thinking about biological robustness. And it was, it was truly a eureka moment. It was like one of the happiest you know, <laughs> periods of my life, I would say, of my scientific life. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that captures such a key idea in this field of biotechnology that it's so interdisciplinary 
and that it's a combination of so many different expertise that can come together to understand and solve these really complex problems in a broad yes. range of applications, which is, again, one of the reasons we're so excited about a journal that can capture so many broad applications, if it's you know, from the therapeutic medical side to the sustainability and agricultural food biotech side, there's just so much to capture with such diverse expertise. And I, I think it exactly. is really diving into this huge pool of amazing science that makes this opportunity really exciting for, for all of us. And with that, I, I want to ask you a bit about your lab and your current research. So can you say a few words about what is it that your lab studies and what is your research? So um, broadly speaking, there are two areas um, and they're not, you know, they're not as separate as I want to describe them, but let's conceptualize them as two areas that we work on. Uh, the first is in the realm of uh, what is broadly known as systems biology, uh, where we uh, try to take what, what exists, biology as it exists today, the biology that evolution has given us and try to understand its principles, um, why it's robust, how does it do signal processing and, and, and so on. Um, so, um, so we have traditionally in that realm of systems biology, we have traditionally focused on stress responses, um, which are the cellular systems that allow cells to survive in hostile environments, increase, you know, fluctuations in temperature, nutrient availability, um, you know, various other harsh environments uh, and, and fluctuations in, in, in cellular and organismal environments. Um, uh, and, and recently we started, uh, you know, thinking more broadly about, you know, what these stress responses are. So these are not only, you know, individual pathways, but these are collaboratives of pathway that work together to give a holistic, holistic response. So we, we went from the pathway to, you know, we're ramping our way up to, uh, you know, the hopefully the whole cell at some at some point. Uh, so that's the first area. The second area is more in uh, synthetic biology or cell engineering. Uh, so um, this is not studying what exists, but trying to create something that doesn't. So building cellular uh, pathways and circuits uh, that can perform with biological molecules that can perform uh, uh, new functions. Um, uh, so you know, again, I, I, I pitched these uh, two research areas, but actually they're not separate at all. And they're, they're intersect in a really interesting way. Uh, so first, um, in, in both, and, and as I you know, mentioned to you, uh, you know, a few minutes ago, in, in both in systems and synthetic biology, our focus is always on trying to build or understand robust systems through the, the use of feedback. Uh, so this conceptual kind of umbrella percolates through the different projects and, and, and thrust areas in the lab. But second, and, and I think this is, this is something that I, 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 I rarely find uh, or hear discussed. Uh, we think about cell engineering as, uh, you know, what, or synthetic biology as what people do for applications. And, applications there are. I mean, th our work focuses on building circuits for living cell therapeutics. Uh, and you mentioned, you know, environmental remediation, um, industrial biotechnology, the applications are immense of this field. But there's also this area of cell engineering that I want to call, it's not an official name, but I want to call it right now precision biology, which is the ability to build circuits that allow us to precisely interface with endogenous biology, with endogenous circuits, perturb them in precise surgical ways so that we can unravel their dynamics, right? So it's, it's like systems, synthetic biology at the service of systems biology, creating circuits that allow us to, new circuits that allow us to interface and understand existing, uh, you know, evolved circuits. Um, I think there is a huge potential that is largely untapped in this application of cell engineering and synthetic biology. Yeah, I think, I think, again, like I said, my PhD work was in this field of signaling and dynamics, and there's always so much 
exciting growth in the field when you're talking about the applications as far as there's again, sustainability or like the therapeutic side, but also from the science perspective, just the ability to tune very specific aspects of the system and look at their dynamics. Mm -hmm. And I really like how you highlighted the aspect of an application being able to look at the science and approach it from a research perspective, because I think oftentimes we uh, we do see applications as these very important, maybe impact in the medicine and these other things that we see in our everyday lives. But there's also this aspect of how we how we're pushing the science forward that I mm -hmm. think is, is really exciting. Uh, absolutely, and it's a continuum. You know, it's not. You know, I, I, the the message I wanted to convey here is that. Uh, you know, these fields and how to push the science forward as a continuum. And there are these feedback loops between application and foundational science and so on everywhere at every level. And uh, what I'm hoping is that we will be able to uh, discuss and highlight and publish on these um, on these connections uh, in our journal. So Hannah, in addition to your role as professor and vice chair in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics at UCSF, can you tell us a bit more about the other activities that you're um, involved with in the Bay Area? How much time do you have? <laughs> uh, it, it, it's so amazing to be in the Bay Area. There's just so much going on uh, in, you know, in, in the broad area of bi biotechnology. Um, uh, so, uh, and I'm involved in a bunch of things, but, I, I, you know, so I'll, I'll highlight one of them, which is very dear to my heart, and which is something that's been in process for a very long time, and that is um, a, an effort that my colleagues, Wenda Lim and Cole Roy by myself have been working on, as I mentioned, for, for a while, and that is uh, something called the Cell Design Institute at UCSF. Uh, so um, the Cell Design Institute is, a, a, is an integral part of a bigger, uh, you know, initiative that UCSF has mounted in live and cell therapeutics. So this idea that the next generation of medicine um, comes from our cells, the body healing itself, right? Taking our cells and using them as these sophisticated, you know, therapeutic robots that can be programmed and dispatched uh, to fix, uh, you know, health problems. Uh, but so, so it's a it's a very broad initiative, and the Cell Design Institute or initiative is kind of a central part of it in the following way. Um, so um, in addition, you know, again, to all the applications that you can think about for, uh, for, for, for living cell therapeutics, um, there, there is a need for foundational technological platforms. Uh, so that's what we want to do in the Cell Design Institute. Uh, so we want to understand biology and biological molecule as a substrate for engineering. Uh, we want to focus on rational circuit design uh, to program cells to be next generation therapies. Uh, we want to build platforms that make cells reliable, precise, and controllable, these controllable mini robots uh, that not only kill cancer, but d d deliver a precise therapeutic payloads, uh, sense the environment they work in, adjust their operation in real time based on what they sense um, as they navigate the body. Uh, so, um, so we want to transform these cells through rational um, and, and predictable design and implementation of biological circuits to really surgical instruments uh, that, you know, again, not only kill cancer, but modulate neuroinflammation, um, build, rebuild the destroyed tissue, uh, heal a wound uh, with high precision and, and, and really exquisite control. Uh, and now is the time for that. I mean, this is why we're doing it now. It's like, um, it, the technology, the conceptual uh, developments, and um, and the need uh, and the potential all came together. The stars are, are aligned, and the you know the time is now, uh, and hopefully we'll play a major role in that in that field at the, the Sound Design Institute. Wow, that sounds amazing, and it's it must be really exciting to be up in the Bay Area where it is indeed one of those huge biotech hubs as far as the research, the industry, and 
you know, everything goes, Bay Area is an amazing place to be. For the Cell Design Institute, are, is it primarily research? Do you have industry collaborations? What is the network at the Cell Design Institute? So uh, right now, it's um, it, right now it's a it's 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 a research institutes. But of course, the ambition is to establish a wide network of partnerships with our local, you know, we, you know, to be part of our local biotech ecosystem. Uh, as we as we build these platforms to kind of dispatch them, not only to, uh, you know, um, uh, to, to for, for, for basic research and, and to academic research, but also uh, to put them out there in the world. Um, to, uh, to, to, to push forward this idea of living cell therapeutics. Uh, so one of our ambitions is actually to build a general purpose um, you know, components that can be used for cancer, for inflammation, for, for, you know, uh, for anything at all. You can imagine that the idea, the concept, the implementation of, of for example, feedback controller, um, you know, again, goes from the controller of your microscope to the controller that, um, let, you know, lands a, a shuttle on Mars. Uh, so we, we want to be that for living cell therapeutics uh, and be part of and collaborating with our local ecosystem and, and hopefully our national and international ecosystem of this, of this field also. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And I think there's so much, like I said, so much exciting science, both in your lab, in the Bay Area. And I, I am so excited to, as we work together, to learn more about all the incredible networks and, and biotech that is happening on Northern California, because I'm based in Southern California, in LA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am so excited that we're on the same coast, by the way. <laughs> yes, it makes things it's much easier. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I do want to shift gears a bit and talk a bit more about the advocacy and outreach that you've been heavily involved with in STEM. And one of the things that I wanted to highlight is that er earlier this year, you co-authored with Gen Biotechnology editorial board member, Professor Lo Lola Anyola Edifeso at University of Michigan this fantastic letter published in Science to Eric Lander, director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, which called attention toward the systemic discrimination in STEM. So can you tell us a little bit more about that mm -hmm. in letter and how it came about? Yes. So, so actually, this 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 editorial um, it, it is an editorial that is phrased as a letter um, on 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 purpose. We wanted a personal personal tone, di direct tone. Uh, so it was actually the result of an invitation to do so by the editor in chief of of Science Magazine uh, to welcome Dr. Lander to the OSTP. Uh, so so let me start by saying uh, that actually. Um, the elevation of the of this position of director of the OSTP um, to ca a cabinet level it is a major win for science. It's it is something that is tremendously significant, uh, and I think we should celebrate it and acknowledge uh, the role that science uh, is 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 increasingly playing. The important role is increasingly playing uh, playing um, in in uh, our. Um, in, in, in our politics and in our, you know, government. Um, so, so, so let's start with that. Let's start with it, it's great. It's great that science has a voice in the White House and such a strong voice. So, uh, but you know, uh, this said, Lola and I, uh, based on so many discussions um, that with our colleagues and with uh, you know, especially in the BME Unite group, which is a, a group of, um, of of biomedical engineers uh, who discuss these issues together, and and uh, our activist group uh, for for equity in STEM, uh, we we felt that with this really you know great elevation of science. Uh, in government came a mandate to make science and STEM participation in general more equitable. Uh, so one can make many arguments why that is. There is, of course, the moral imperative. Uh, 
for, 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 for making you know, STEM more equitable. And it's a very important argument. We should do it because it's the right thing to do. But also, if we wanna be more pragmatic, there is actually a scientific and economic imperative to doing so. So here's the idea very simply put. If that science is now front and center of this administration, then how to capitalize on the diverse talent of the country and how to foster innovation through diversity, and the science here is clear, diversity foster innovation. Diverse teams are more innovative by you know, quantitative metrics. They're more innovative than monolithic teams uh, is also should be front and center. The two have to go together. We elevate science. We have to think about how to capitalize on, uh, how, how, how to make science the best it could. So, so in that, in that, uh, in that editorial, that letter to Dr. Lander, we enumerated the ways in which uh, the STEM enterprise is actually falling short on that. Um, our tone was polite, we were told, but it was very impatient. And actually the impatience is, is, is really genuine. Um, what we said is, okay, enough with studies, with polls, with past quarters, we know what the problems are. We've actually known that for a couple of decades, what the problems are. So let's just go for it. Um, so that, that was our message. Yeah, I love that. And I think when I read this piece, what really struck me was just how action oriented it was. And that tone, like you said, of being that we know the issues and this is something urgent that we want to address. Mm -hmm. And I think some actions you listed in this editorial were that we can make inclusive STEM education a priority. We can change the leadership to be more representative, some accountability systems for discrimination, sexism, racism, and harassment. Mm -hmm. These are all things, as you said, we have know what the problems are. And really this call to action tone of this letter, I think, was so important. And and impactful during a time where, as you said, elevating this position to the cabinet level is a huge win for science. And it's a really timely moment to call to action some of these key issues that we've known and really mm -hmm. to implement some of these action items that you've listed. Absolutely. Uh, I also... I. Wanted to ask you, how do you plan to implement this activism in your role as editor in chief of Gen Biotechnology? Uh, basically, put my money where my mouth is, right? Uh, in the sense that uh, you know, uh, have a a diverse and diversity could be very broadly defined, right? Diversity in scientific perspective, in career stages, in, in all kinds of metrics, a diverse editorial board, a diverse set of reviewers, um, trying to, uh, to, to, to hear and promote the perspectives of these diverse uh, you know, scientists and biotechnologists and give them a forum uh, to, uh, to, to, to voice uh, what you know their ambitions what they see as the future of the field but also their frustrations um you know the problems that they see where where we're held back in 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 this field um and that again could be you know scientific hurdles and challenges that could be sociological challenges that could be issues of uh you know uh of of, of diversity and inclusion uh and and and, and so on uh, so, so I, I really hope that we can, um, within the realm of this journal, we can implement some of the, the calls to action that we had in that, in that editorial. Yeah, I love it. And you mentioned the amazing international editorial board of these leaders in biotech that you're assembling for Gen Biotechnology. And did you want to speak a bit more about this editorial board, how are you mm -hmm. growing it? Who's on it? And what are you excited about with this new team? I, I wish I could list all the names of people who are already on it. They're amazing. I'm just so excited. 
to be working with all of them. Um, so it's, it's, it's really an amazing set. So, so go to the website of the journal and check out who's on our editorial board. It's just, you'll be amazed actually at, at the talent there. Uh, so it's an amazing set of scientists, engineers, biotechnologists, and it's still growing. We're not done yet. Um, so it's, and, and you know, as we, as we mentioned, it's uh, at least my hope is that it will be diverse in every sense of the world, design, uh, word designed to capture the different angles of biotechnology, the different flavors of it based on, um, and, and that's actually really important based on, 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 on regional needs and applications. Uh, so one thing that I'm hoping to capture both on our editorial board and on uh, the papers and perspectives and so on and the pieces we publish is uh, this idea that different parts of the world uh, have different needs for biotechnology, different applications maybe of the same technologies or, or different technologies are together that cater to their local challenges and opportunities. Uh, the, the challenges in, in Africa might not be you know, the same as those in the Middle East might not be the, the same as those in Australia or in the, in, in the US. And there is vibrant biotechnology in all of these places. Um, and I just hope again, through our editorial board membership and through the, the material we publish that we capture this, this, this international, um, you know, biotechnology and its potential for the world. Yeah, I, again, I am also super excited with this incredible team of editorial board members that we currently have on the board. And as Hannah said, you can go to our website, genbiotechjournal.com to get more information and to see this incredible group of leaders in biotech that we have leading this journal. And I think this also jumps into my next question about what kind of content will we expect from Gen Biotechnology and what is your overall vision for the journal? Yeah, so uh, I think we touched a little bit on this and bits and pieces. So let me put it all together, you know, in our previous conversation. So let me put it together in one in one place now. So what I really would like is for this journal to cover all aspects of biotechnology, the full ecosystem, which I think is a unique challenge, but also a huge opportunity. Uh, it's, 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 it's really, there's tremendous need to kind of bring, you know, different branches of biotechnology together to, uh, you know, to, 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 to a, a broad readership. Uh, so I want to, I, I would love to publish the science, of course, the most rigorous science, but also reflect on the sociology of the field. Uh, of the opportunities of the field, its nascent talent, its challenges, um, uh, on, on the fact that we often see this artificial, artificial separation in biotechnology between the foundational and the applied, um, which actually shouldn't exist. I, 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 I hope, you know, Gen Biotech will be the journal that not only publishes paper on the foundational aspect of biotechnology and the applied, um, uh, uh, aspects of biotechnology, but the leaps that people make between the two and, you know, in the same lab, maybe, or in the same institution or in, through collaborations. And also, so that's the positive, but I also would love it if we can capture uh, when these leaps actually don't happen, when they should happen, when some foundational technology doesn't make it to an applied setting, uh, what's holding that back? So I hope we can reflect also on that. Uh, so from cutting edge science to um, looking forward perspectives to voices telling the field what is holding us back and what we're doing right. Um, uh, of course, you know, as we discussed, we would like to feature diverse science, diverse voices uh, who speak to different technological and conceptual and scientific needs of our community and the world. Um, and I really, really would like to um, to see how we can focus on young, you know, uh, young voices and, and their perspectives about what the future holds. That's, I, I really, I, I love all of that. And I think one of the things that was super exciting for me about this journal is 
because it's going to be this fresh modern voice in such a booming time during the biotech industry. And that includes, as you mentioned, Hannah, that uplifting maybe these uh, younger voices that, that honestly, in a lot of platforms, I think in STEM is, is harder for them to be heard. And having a project like this, where there is so much freedom to form what that voice is going to be, maybe tackle a new modern audience that is harder to do at more established projects is a really exciting thing to be a part of. Absolutely. Add that to the list of, um, of, of, of why I'm excited about this role at Gen Biotech. So that's our first question. Uh, we, we keep adding items to that list. <laughs> We're just all so excited <laughs> yeah. about this. And I think another common theme in the biotech industry is that indeed, like I said, it's booming in both academia and industry. And I wanted to ask, how does gen biotechnology fit in as far as, I guess, what I like to say and imagine this bridge between these Mm -hmm. two areas that should work collaboratively and cohesively? And how does gen biotechnology play a part in, in bridging that? Yeah, so, so, um, you know, let me put my, you know, uh, uh, my, my, my scientist hat now. Uh, so from that experience, being, you know, a scientist and, you know, a biotechnologist myself, um, I actually feel there is a great need for platforms that, um, that is not over-specialized in one area of biotechnology, that covers biotechnology at large, uh, both in terms of its basic and translational applied research. Um, so there are, you know, as, as we keep mentioning, there are so many branches of biotechnology. It's just such a rich area that covers, you know, all, almost everything in our lives from the medicines we take to the food we grow and eat, you know, uh, and everything in between. Um, and, 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 but these, these, you know, technologies and, you know, intellectual advances are sometimes in, in these fields are sometimes siloed. Uh, For example, as someone who works in synthetic biology, uh, hacking into uh, the cells with biological molecules, um, I don't get the opportunity in one journal to um, read about, for example, the latest in how nanotechnology and uh, human-made materials uh, can also hack into cells, uh, or how others are using bioelectronics, or you know, many, many other things that I really have to be, you know, to go around and be intentional in scavenging these, all of these things, piece bits and pieces of information and biotechnology that might be very relevant to my work. So, um, uh, so, 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 so the idea that we can build a platform that brings all of this together to the same audience and readership um, uh, that introduces people routinely to ideas, technology from outside their immediate application of focus. Uh, and, and, and in this way help, uh, you know, cross hybridize the field, uh, you know, and bring together all of its intellectual and technological richness is very, very appealing. Um, so, so uh, I think that's the best thing we can do for the future of biotechnology, bringing it all together, um, and 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 giving people access to it in one place. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what, like you said, what was really exciting about this journal is the range of the audience that we're aiming to reach, as far as not just scientists, but also people if it's at the policy level or or investors who Mm -hmm. are investing in these different biotech initiatives there is just so many different as it should different people who are interested in this very impactful field of biotech and its wide applications that we're aiming to hit with this journal all right, so Hannah, how can people in the biotech community get involved with Gen Biotechnology? Uh, there are so many ways. Uh, first of all, and obviously, 
uh, send us your scientific papers, your breakthroughs, the amazing thing, things that you've discovered or that you have built, but also uh, send us your perspective. What excites you in the field? Um, also, what frustrates you in the field? Where, where should we go and we're not going? Um, if you are in industry, we also want to hear from you. Tell us what you think academia should do. Is doing, you know, um, it is doing well or not well. If you are in academia, what should industry do differently? What 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 would catalyze your, um, you know, a collaboration you might have with industry if the industry did something differently or you know focused on on on, on different you know application areas and so on. Um, so, so I guess what I'm trying to say is wherever you are in that very broad and rich field of biotechnology that is just going to, you know, I, I actually have no doubt biotechnology is going to save the world. We, you know, that's our chance. So if you are anywhere in this amazing field, enter in a communication with us about how to make uh, the, the, this journal really a meeting space for the field. Um, and what role you think you might play in that. Uh, so this is really an invitation um, to all to think and propose novel, novel ways uh, where you, know, you can engage with us and with this journal. Absolutely. And if you're wondering how to reach us, you can get involved with Gen Biotechnology by sending us any editorial inquiries by email to editor at genbiotechjournal.com. You can also learn more about us at genbiotechjournal.com and follow us on Twitter at genbiotechjournal. All right, Hannah, thank you so much for taking the time to chat today about this incredibly new, exciting journal called Gen Biotechnology. I am really excited to work together and make an incredible impact in all of science, not just in communicating the research, but also in diversity, equity, inclusion, and all of the incredible facets of science that we've discussed today. Thank you so much, Faye. I really enjoyed talking with you today. And I'm just so excited about this travel. And about the field. Yes. Yeah. We're oh, wow. launching early 2022, everyone. Yes. Get ready. <laughs>